Rafael Guedes, de Esquiro, e desfone, Rafael. Rafael. Hello, hello. Rafael was my first connection to Crowell, because Rafael, uh, I suspect, Rafael, let me ask Rafael. Rafael, do you use Crowell in Varsonics? Yes, yes, we use every day. Rafael, Rafael works in a hospital. They have a, a enterprise there for analysis of what genome? What do you analyze there, Rafael? Uh, we, we are a company, it's called Varsomics, and we do all sorts of uh, genomic analysis. Uh, we, are, we are now doing uh, uh, WGS, exome, RNA-seq, all, all sorts of analysis. Mm -hmm. So, Geraldine, here in my university, we have a nice cluster installed here that we control. But I learned that Rafael does not have a cluster. He does everything with Cromwell. So then uh, I asked an a, a ex-student of mine, a colleague of Rafael, because Rafael was my student too, Elisa. Elisa is working in Broad Institute, Elisa Donato. Uh, Elisa, I asked Elisa, put me in touch with Crowell, and she she gave me the she she entered the Crowell Slack and invited me, and then I posted there. Who can talk about Crowell to us? And some somebody uh, answered uh, Geraldine, and I said, Oh, I know Geraldine. <laughs> It's gonna be easy. <laughs> so. Uh, That's one of the details. So Rafael is a user. We have many students like Rafael that will go to companies and they will need to, to use the solution, right? Mm -hmm. And today I was speaking to some people that teach bioinformatics in EBI actually. Mm -hmm. And I, I just invited them because we, we want to kind of include Uh, teaching the use of cloud in uh, the the workshops that they are teaching uh, over there too. So maybe they will arrive here. So then we suspect that we have connections uh, here uh, from many places in Brazil. I asked already for people to, to place in the chat. Lucas Blasher. Lucas Blasher is uh, from Belo Horizonte, right, Lucas? <laughs> you are muted. Yeah, Lucas okay. Bleicher uh, works more for protein structure, etc. So working with cluster is also important nowadays. Say hi, Lucas. Oh, hi. Yeah, so <laughs> mostly doing molecular dynamics. Molecular dynamics. Is it possible to use a GPU in with Cromwell? Geraldine, probably yes, right? Uh, yes, yes, absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. It's a matter of configuring the, the back end um, uh -huh. appropriately, yeah. yeah. So if you could comment on GPU usage, etc. We are preparing this and we never start uh, exactly in, in the hour. So some five to 10 minutes occasionally. Okay, we, yeah. we, we, we go like popcorn. We are looking to the number of participants here. And uh, I did not connect to YouTube, but we have people arriving in YouTube, right, Rafael? Are you connected there? Yes, I'm connected, but uh, I, I can't keep you, you both can... online at the same time <laughs> because the sound will get crazy. Ah, I know. Okay. Yeah. I will check also the YouTube. Uh, so, uh, Geraldine, so it's possible that we are going to, in a company, have a cluster with Cromwell? How did you get into this, uh, Geraldine? How was this Cromwell thing in Boston? Oh, um, I mean, the, the origins are of, of Cromwell are that within the broad about, gosh, it's almost 10 years ago now, um, mm. it was becoming obvious that the, the existing infrastructure was not going to be able to cope with the amount of sequencing data that we were generating. Um, yeah. We were... We were on track. I mean, everybody was was rapidly expanding the amount of, of sequence they were generated. Uh, we were probably a bit ahead of the curve just in terms of volume. Um, and it was becoming clear that we needed to either expand 
the on-prem cluster or, or um, move to cloud. And so there was a working group that kind of looked at the question and the cost and so on um, and decided ultimately to, to go to cloud for uh, starting with the genomic analysis uh, mm -hmm. processing um, and ultimately a lot of other you know, data and compute uh, went to cloud. Uh, we still have some people who are working on-prem uh, for a variety of, of use cases, um, but we have moved very heavily towards the cloud. Um, and so initially it was really, okay, we need we need a better way to uh, do, because the, the on-prem system was not going to port well to the cloud. And so it was an opportunity to kind of reimagine what that looked like. Um, and as part of that, Cromwell was developed uh, as the new workflow manager. Um, the Whittle language was uh, uh, created at that time within the Broad as well, although that has mm -hmm. left um, the Broad in terms of the, the uh, maintenance, maintenance and development of the language itself. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's that's really started so us off on a you, big. You, you did not focus on let us uh, teach people to use. Uh, 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 HPC in companies. You, you, you need it for your own work. Um, yeah, I mean, it's... To run analysis in broad institutes. Yes, that's right. It was really an internal need. It was not, it was not something that was made initially for the community. And, and I will say that Cromwell remains something that is primarily like the development priorities are primarily internal. Um, and it's it has historically been a struggle to, to try to support the community as a as greater community has adopted Cromwell itself. Um, and a lot of people do want to use it in, in various ways mm -hmm. on different clouds, on different on-premise backends with different schedulers. Um, it's something that unfortunately we're not able to put a lot of resources into, um, you know, supporting those uses. But as the, that external community grows, um, we think that there's a kind of community, intra-community support that can, uh -huh. that can develop. Um, because it is something that is very promising in terms of um, it's a system that you can use in a hybrid way or on-prem or just on cloud. Um, mm -hmm. And that has a lot of advantages. Uh, it, it does, um, Cromwell itself is a fairly comp complex uh, piece of software. Um, and there is, and I think I, I mentioned it briefly in, in my talk, um, there is another Whittle engine that's called Mini Whittle um, that is not as much developed for scale um, although it is capable of, of um, substantial scale, but it's it's uh, more accessible um, for mm -hmm. individual users as opposed to you know IT teams that have their own great DevOps and but so on. But Geraldine, you want to to get this knowledge also in this audience is where I claim their attention for that. So please, uh, please, everyone try to learn about because then we can have a community in Brazil that can support. Right? So if, if we need some support for the beginner, can we ask you for some help in, in the beginning? Well, I think it, it depends. I'm for one personally, I'm very happy to help as much as I can. I know, I know. I will say that. Um, uh, for you know other types of support beyond that, it it might depend mm -hmm. what what is necessary. I will say that my I wasn't entirely sure about the audience for this talk, um, so I tried to go for a fairly broad introduction to um, yeah. to the topic. Mo mo most mostly this is all uh, PhD programs on bioinformatics uh, or genetics. Uh, they have uh, local seminars. So mm -hmm. then we are sharing you with uh, many places around the country. So uh, it's a seminar for PhD program, but not only for Minas Gerais, for many, many places in Brazil. Before I, we, we get started, I will ask the chat people to, to write in the chat, what, where are you connecting from? So please write here. People that are in YouTube, uh, there are many people there, 
please post there because then I, I can collect the information uh, at the end and pass to uh, Geraldine, okay? Uh, so, Geraldine, I will pass the command to Rafael. I was saying for the audience that arrived earlier that Rafael is a user of Cromwell. So, uh, he works in a company. So, please introduce yourself, Rafael, and say again that you are a user. So, what's the connection between us and Geraldine, please? So I think we can get started, Rafael. It's your comment. I will close my microphone and camera and then uh, you do the introduction and comment. Thanks, Geraldine, for coming and talking to us. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Miguel. So thank you, Geraldine, for accepting the, the invitation. Uh, my name is Rafael Guedes. I'm also a, a bioinformatician. Uh, today I'm working at uh, Hospital Israeli Talbot Einstein. Yeah, São Paulo, Brazil, and uh, I'm also look at the Barzomics. Uh, we use WDL and Chrono in our infrastructure. Um, so just to give a, a brief introduction, uh, Dr. Geraldine earned her PhD in biological engineering from the University Catholique de Louvain in Belgium, followed by a postdoctoral at Harvard Medical School she joined Broad Institute in 2012, where she has always been an active member of the JTK community. I believe we all know her very, really well from, from all the, the questions when you are Google, there's always one question that you answer over the, the forums. So with many contributions and uh, also at the JTK tools development. She's now the Director of Outreach and Communications for the Data Science Platform at the Broad Institute and MIT. And today we have the opportunity to learn a lot more about the, the important role of the cloud uh, in this era of the genomic analysis and having an, as, a, as an example, the, the integration of GHK, Chromo, WDL, and, and Terra, right? Which you, you use over there, your cloud platform. Okay, so without uh, further ado, thank you, Geraldine, for accepting the invitation again, and the word is yours. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for inviting me. It's it's lovely to be with you today uh, virtually. I am going to figure out how to share my screen. Um, here we go. All right, uh, hopefully you see um, my PowerPoint screen. Everything good? Yes, yep. everything good. Fantastic. Okay, so I'm going to talk about running workflows on the cloud, uh, and I'm going to uh, I'm going to try to give kind of a broad introduction to the topic of, of workflows and the kind of languages we use, um, and, and try to justify kind of what uh, why things work the way they do uh, in a way that's hopefully relevant to your research. Uh, most of the development on our side is driven by genomics use cases primarily. Um, so many of my examples are from genomics. Uh, towards the end, I'll give some, some examples that are a bit broader than, than just genomics. Um, but I'll try to explain enough so that anybody without a genomics background should be able to follow and hopefully see how this would be relevant um, to your own work. All right, so let's talk about running workflows on the cloud. Uh, first, a quick introduction on genomics, genomics in a nutshell, for anybody who's not already familiar um, with the domain. Uh, the idea here is just, uh, it's, a, it's a big data challenge. Um, every single human, uh, to simplify, has a human genome that's about three gigabases of information. If you just look at like, the pure information in the, in the DNA. Uh, when we do whole genome sequencing, uh, we're going to generate like a more than 100 gigabyte file of short sequences that, um, that, that tile all across the genome. And within that, just thinking about simple variants, we're looking for four to five million small differences, tiny differences relative to a standardized reference. Um, and out of that, 
uh, depending on what you're looking for, looking at a particular disease or, or traits or things like that, you'll still have to identify which differences actually matter. Out of those millions, there's only a handful potentially that might be relevant um, to what you're studying. Um, and so we have this huge pile of uh, information that we need to sift through. And so the way we do that is with uh, workflows that are sometimes called pipelines that apply multiple steps of data processing and analysis to go from the huge pile of inf raw information to the kind of distilled information that you're actually going to extract biological insights from. So these are just three examples of um, parts of genomics pipelines that are uh, done with the Genome Analysis Toolkit, which is a software toolkit that's also developed at the Broad Institute. Um, and the, the point here is that the, the yellow boxes represent steps where we run a tool to do something to the data. Sometimes there's actually several commands that need to be run within a single box. And all of these are steps that can be largely automated because from one run to the next, we want to do it exactly the same way for every sample, for every for every file that comes in. Um, and we want, we want to do that in a way that's as automated as possible so that we reduce human error um, and we can easily reproduce uh, the work and um, port it, have it be portable and reproducible across different platforms. Um, so that's where our use of workflows come from. Uh, so this it's really this need to be able to very reproducibly apply a series of analysis steps or data processing steps in, in a way that's highly automated. Um, now, traditionally in bioinformatics, uh, a lot of early pipelining was done with tools like simply Bash or Python, and you would basically write the list of command lines that you want to run on the data and write a bunch of code around these uh, command lines that manage file inputs and outputs that control the flow of execution and things like that. But basically you write in a linear way, everything that needs to happen um, for your analysis. And that's, that's the way you would uh, automate it in the, uh, olden days. <laughs> uh, now things have evolved quite a lot. And over the past five to 10 years, there's a number of um, new systems and languages that have arisen uh, that are increasingly used to do this sort of work. And I've put a few examples there. There are other ones. Uh, Snakemake is one that I, is probably uh, could be included in, in here. Whittle, CWL, so Whittle Workflow Description Language, CWL, the Common Workflow Language, uh, and Nextflow, uh, which is a kind of a third um, a increasingly popular uh, workflow language. These are newer languages that have been designed specifically for um, for executing workflows, uh, specifically scientific workflows. They're primary in the, primarily in the context of biology and the life sciences, computational biology, um, but they can absolutely be uh, used for other, um, other domains, other, other uh, fields of study. And one of the, the key uh, traits of these new systems is that instead of having just one file, uh, you know, to to um, to simplify a bit, instead of having one file that just includes every single thing you do to the data, that mixes in the file handling, the actual scientific analysis, and then some more logistics of uh, setting, um, you know, specifying which machine uh, the work gets run on. Instead of that, uh, with the new systems, the new languages, you can really enforce a separation between the scientific work itself that you want to do and the logistics of how it's supposed to get done. So what kind of machine it runs on and a number of things that uh, that don't really have to do with the science itself, but, but have to do more with, with making it happen in practice. Um, and that's actually a very important feature that informs a lot of the design decisions for how we do this kind of work. Um, and those are the kinds of uh, things I'm going to talk about a lot today. 
Now, uh, I can't talk about this without mentioning containers. Uh, containers are, so we'll, we'll do a quick little sidebar for people who are not familiar with containers yet. Uh, containers, which you might hear called Docker containers. Docker is a brand uh, of software um, that offers containerization um, capabilities. There are others uh, like Singularity. Um, a container is a way to encapsulate all the necessary software that you would need to run a particular tool or set of tools. Um, and so if I'm on computer A and I've assembled, you know, I have a tool, maybe I have a toolkit like GTK, I can encapsulate everything that the GTK needs. Uh, I can specify the exact version, the, the version of Java, the version of whatever libraries are needed by my tool. I can encapsulate all of that in an image that I can then share in the registry. And you, on your computer, you can uh, download that registry, uh, that, that image from the registry, um, and then run it on your computer, and you will have the exact same compute environment replicated on your computer so that you don't, you no longer need to worry about finding installation instructions and you know, what library, what version, and then find it con con conflicts with something else that you need. There are package managers, like uh, the Conda environment system is, pretty, is a pretty good way to manage those things, but you still run into issues. Containers are right now kind of the best solution for, for doing this sort of thing in a way that you can really, I don't want to say guarantee, but let's say guarantee, let's be bold, uh, guarantee that you're providing the exact environment um, that is necessary to run a given tool or, or set of tools. Um, so that is something that is really important, especially when you're thinking about complex pipelines. Um, some complex pipelines have certain tools at different uh, stages of the pipelines that might have conflicting dependencies. Um, if, you, uh, if you are create a container for each separate step, uh, you no longer have to worry about that because each step will be run, will be able to run in exactly the right way, exactly the right environment that it needs. Um, and that means that you can share uh, tools and configurations with collaborators across the world uh, in a way that's much simpler than we used to be able to do. So that, that's what containers are really all about uh, enabling in this context. Um, this means, oh yes, and, and another feature of these new systems uh, and these new languages is that they make it easier than in the past to actually execute the work on separate machines um, and dispatch uh, different, uh, make sure that different steps can be executed on different kinds of machines. In this case, I'm going to talk about virtual machines primarily because uh, that's kind of the cloud world. Um, but it's it's really about being able to uh, have a high level of granular control on what happens to each step independently of others. And part of that is so that you can, you can decide to execute different steps of your pipeline on virtual machines that have different technical specifications. So if you have a task, um, if you're running like in, in for the first step of your pipeline, a tool that needs a lot of memory, but there's not a lot of data involved for whatever reason, um, you can assign that to run to on a virtual machine that's configured with a lot of memory and a small disk. Um, meanwhile, maybe the next one doesn't need as much memory but it needs a huge amount of disk because it's copying big data sets or something like that. Um, and you can, you can very granularly uh, assign uh, the kind of compute resources that each, steps need, each step needs independently. Um, and that on the cloud is going to be very important because it's going to allow you to, um, uh, to optimize for speed and cost because the cloud offers you uh, the possibility of having access to different kinds of machines. 
And the cost, so what you will pay to use those machines is going to depend um, on their technical specification. If you have a very powerful machine, you're going to pay more per minute uh, compared to a little teeny tiny one. Um, and so you wanna make sure that you don't have a long running job that only takes a tiny amount of compute uh, running on a huge beefy virtual machine because then you would pay, be paying a lot of money um, for not using uh, the capabilities of that machine. And so being able to have that granular control is uh, is really important. And by the way, I'm realizing as I talk that um, I'm not saying why you would want to go to the cloud. <laughs> I'm just assuming that you do. Um, but uh, at Towards the end, we can talk a little bit more about why, why you might want to do that. But if you are going to the cloud, this is kind of the way to do it. You want to be able to uh, control the resources that you provide to each step in your pipeline. It's a very uh, important feature. And that is something that these new workflow languages are, are designed to do. Um, I'm not going to talk about all of them. I'm going to talk specifically about the workflow description language. Um, and the workflow manager called Cromwell, that's represented by this um, sympathetic flying pig. Uh, it's, uh, their name is Jamie, um, and they're inspired from uh, James Cromwell, the American actor. There's a whole story behind that. I'm happy to answer questions about that at the end. But uh, for now, let's um, keep going and talk about what is the workflow description language exactly? Um, how is it structured? And how can you use it with Cromwell to run your pipelines efficiently at an at scale? Now, uh, the workflow description language, which we pronounce WDL or WIDL for short, uh, was originally created at the Broad Institute, uh, but now it's stewarded by an open community-driven organization that's called Open Whittle, which you can find at openwhittle.org. Um, and we're always happy to, um, I'm, I'm part of the governance, governance team, and we're always happy to, to have uh, community contribution and participation um, in you know, suggesting what should be uh, the evolution of the language, what it should be capable of doing. Uh, we'd love to get uh, contributions uh, of workflows that people have written, uh, maybe tutorials, presentations that you've given to teach your, your collaborators uh, how to use it. Um, please do come to OpenWiddle and participate uh, and help us grow the community. So it is a workflow description language that is designed to uh, describe workflows. So let's talk a little bit about how that works. Um, very briefly, I'm not going to show a lot of code today, but I do want to give you at least an idea of how it works. Um, if you look here on, uh, there, there's kind of two high level pieces to a, a Whittle script. Um, on the left side uh, is an example of a task definition. It's kind of abstracted away, but that's how we would write a task definition where you'll uh, specify some inputs, uh, to your task, you'll have a command block that basically gives the command line or set of command lines that should be run um, as part of the job. There'll be a runtime section uh, where you can uh, specify which Docker container to use um, and some additional like, resource related um, uh, information and an output block that says, okay, this is the final output of my task. Um, and by putting something in the final output, by saying what is going to be produced by the task, you make that available to other tasks in the workflow. Okay, so that's your basic task de definition on the left. Now on the right, that's the actual workflow uh, script overall. Um, and the workflow script uh, will include, again, high level inputs um, that it expects. Uh, any number, one or more um, calls to task. So here we're calling task A, then another one called task B. You can have as many of them as you want. Um, interestingly, you don't have to list them in order uh, because the, the system will, at the time, you know, fast forward to when you actually run the scripts, the system will identify what are the inputs and the outputs, and it will create a graph 
uh, that specifies which what order things should be run in, uh, depending on what uh, inputs and outputs they depend on. Um, which is a very common feature of, of these uh, modern workflow uh, languages and systems. Anyway, um, so you write your workflow, uh, you list the calls to tasks, you can have some additional code in there for controlling uh, the flow of execution, and I'll show uh, some examples in a minute. But I want you to just have in mind, like, that's the, the fundamental syntax of Whittle that is already sufficient to write a simple workflow. Um, okay, so here's an example. Um, in this example, we're running a tool called Haplotype Caller, which is just, uh, it's a tool that's part of GHK and that takes in uh, a BAM file. It's a, it's a format. Uh, that's a file that contains the DNA sequencing information. It'll take in a list of intervals, uh, which can be a list of chromosomes or more granular list of, of genomic intervals, uh, specifying which territory in the genome you want to analyze. Um, and it'll take in a reference, which is a reference genome, uh, to use as a reference for identifying variants. And it will output a file here in a format called GVCF that will contain the variants that it has identified. So the differences uh, that it has identified in the genome of the particular sample you feed to it. Um, the workflow here, I'm not showing all the code for the workflow, but the key things uh, that you would see are, is at the very top, the workflow block uh, containing the call to the haplotype caller task. Um, and either within the same file or a file that is referenced in the workflow file, you would have the definition of the haplotype caller um, task. Within that task, uh, you will find, in addition to input definitions, which I'm not showing here, you would find the actual command. And in this case, it's a very, uh, typical GHK command where you uh, invoke the GHK itself, uh, specify you want to run the haplotype caller tool, and then you feed in the various inputs that are um, that are shown uh, in the little diagram. So the reference, the input BAM file, uh, a name for your output file, and a path to the genomic intervals. And you see here, it's not full paths and file names. It's, uh, we, use, um, uh, we use variables to hold that information so that you can pass in that information at runtime. Okay, so that's a super basic uh, widow script um, showing the key information that you would need to uh, run this very simple work one-step workflow. Uh, a common need in genomics is actually to do something like parallelizing execution. So let's say now I, I still want to identify variants in my sample, but I don't want to do it linearly across the entire genome in, in just one job because that will take a very long time. Instead, what I can do is uh, parallelize execution so I can define a scatter um, per interval saying for each interval in my list of intervals, I want to do a separate invocation of the haplotype caller tool. And the way to do that, this is a very common need in genomics. And the way to do that in Whittle is there's a built-in function called scatter. Um, and if you say scatter, you specify on the basis of what you want to scatter here, the intervals in the list. Um, and then you have that call statement. Uh, you provide the inputs. The system will uh, paralyze the execution by genomic interval. And that's all the code you need to write to get the parallelism to be implemented. Um, and that will generate the same number of compute jobs as you have intervals in your list of intervals. Um, provide some inputs. Then in the next step in your workflow, you have another task called merge VCFs. That's going to take the per interval outputs of the haplotype caller job, and it will merge them all into a single file if you want a single file output at the end of your workflow. Um, 
And the nice thing is you can simply refer to uh, the output defined in the haplotype caller task. Say I want to take as input to the merge job, I want to take the output of all the individual outputs of the scatter jobs um, and then create a single, single file. And then you have a final output to your workflow, which is the merged file. And so again, without going too far into the, the code, uh, I don't want to overwhelm anybody who's kind of new to, to coding, um, but this should give you a, an idea of how to do something that's very common, like paralyze, paralyzing over intervals. Uh, you can also paralyze over files. You can nest them so you can paralyze uh, over files and over intervals and anything else you want. Um, but you can do something like that without actually having to write a lot of code to control what goes in, what goes out, um, where. I hope that makes sense. So that's a very common thing that we do, and that's how you do it in Whittle. Um, I want to show you additionally, uh, since I mentioned about how I mentioned how you can, that it's a really important that you can specify how many resources you want to go give to each job um, that goes in the task definition. Uh, you have a runtime block. And on that runtime block, uh, you can, in addition to the Docker container to use for that task, you can also provide the amount of memory um, and the type and amount of disk you want to use for storage. You can choose uh, from common types like the, the hard drive. You can also uh, if you have the hardware available, you can specify you want a solid state drive. You can also um, provide alternative types of uh, processor units. So by default, it'll execute on CPU. But if you have GPUs available, you would add in the runtime block here, um, you would add uh, some um, some specific properties that say that you want this to run on your GPUs. Uh, there can be a little bit of variation depending on the exact infrastructure that you're using, how you control that. Um, and that's actually one of the challenges as we see more different types of computing equipment kind of become available and popular in this field, it, it becomes tricky to um, uh, <laughs> uh, code that into the language in a way that doesn't um, uh, break portability. Uh, but that's a whole other discussion. And if that's something that you're interested in, we can certainly talk about it uh, at the end um, in the in the Q&A. Um, so that's, uh, again, it's, it's a fairly uh, simple way to control resources. Um, and you there, there's a lot that you can do to have, for example, the amount of disk that you provide. You can uh, you can hard code it, you can provide it as an input at runtime, you can even have the system calculate it based on some factors like the size of the input file and things like that. It's, it's pretty flexible. And finally, uh, you might be thinking, okay, that's great, but how do I actually specify what files to run on? Um, and, and how do I specify those additional uh, um, properties that I want to, to uh, set at runtime. And basically you will, uh, at the time that you want to run the job, uh, you'll provide a JSON file that specifies for each of the variables that is uh, listed in your Whittle script, uh, you will uh, provide a path to the file. Um, in this case, these are local paths for the, the set of files that we're using. Plus, um, I have a Docker image here that references a Docker container that's in the Google Container Registry. And I'm also providing a, some Java options um, to set the, the Java options for the job. Um, you can use local files for the paths. You can also use um, buckets, uh, object storage files if you have your, your data in a cloud bucket. Uh, that's a little bit beyond what I'm going to talk about today, but again, there's some flexibility there and I'm happy to answer questions. Now, once you have your Whittle workflow written uh, and you have your file of uh, inputs in JSON format, all you need to do, famous last words, is run Cromwell. 
um, Cromwell is a Java tool. You can run it. It has a simple uh, one-off run mode that I'm showing here. And so in that mode, um, you would call the Cromwell jar, uh, say run haplotype caller dot whittle. That's my whittle script. Um, dash I is to specify the inputs uh, and give the name of the path and the name of the uh, inputs JSON file and hit return. And that will start up the Cromwell uh, application, um, which will then interpret, read your workflow, interpret it, generate individual jobs that are, there's basically bash, uh, mini bash scripts for each of the steps. Um, if you have a step that's parallelized, it will generate jobs for the number of items in your, your scatter list. Um, and then once it has that big pile of jobs that need to be run, um, including their relationships of which one is dependent on which other is being already done, it'll send that, it'll send them um, in the appropriate order to your either your local scheduler or the cloud backend for the cloud that you want to use. And I'll talk about that in, in a little bit. But what's important here is that for each of those jobs, each one will be sent to a machine um, that will, uh, and the system will coordinate getting the container, retrieving the container that's specified in the task runtime, uh, retrieving the uh, relevant inputs from storage, uh, running the job, and then copying out the outputs um, to the, the place that you specified as, as the place for outputs. Um, and so all of that will happen without intervention on your part. And if everything works well, um, it will eventually uh, shut down and tell you uh, where your outputs are. Now that's the uh, high level description of what happens with Cromwell in run mode. And run mode is what I would say a, uh, a individual user would run if if I have just like one pipeline from time to time to kick off and I don't need more than that, I could do it in that way. Um, there is a server mode. So for teams who want to maintain their own Cromwell server and who have uh, either the, the capabilities themselves or the IT supports to manage the server, you can maintain your own Cromwell server that stays up. Um, and then you can submit uh, workflows to execute to that server um, through a REST, uh, RESTful API. Um, I'm not demonstrating that usage here because uh, it's a little more specialized. It is certainly what you would want to do if you have frequent kind of regular um, workflow execution needs. Uh, and one of the things that that gives you uh, if you're running in the server mode is a feature called call caching. That's basically some people know it as a smart resume feature, right? And the idea is that if your workflow gets um, fails or gets interrupted for whatever reason, uh, you can run the exact same command again uh, if let's say if it was a transient infrastructure issue, like the, the machine had a hiccup, um, you can just kick off that same job again. Or if there was a particular uh, command in one of the tasks that you realize you use the wrong argument or something like that, you can fix the workflow there, run it again, and the system will check. Uh, it'll have created a little database and it'll check have I seen this exact combination before of this, this set of input files with this workflow script um, with this version of the container? And if it all has been done before, it'll check for each task, uh, have I already pr produced an output for that one or not? Um, and if it can access the outputs, it'll, it'll just copy over that output. Um, basically, this, <laughs> that's a long way to describe it. The short, uh, short way to say it is it will resume at point of failure, um, point of failure or interruption. And so whatever you've already done before, it's not going to redo all the work. And so that is a very nice way of being able to um, resume work in, in case of, of certain types of issues 
or corrections to the workflow without having to redo everything that was done in the past. Um, it's very popular on cloud. Not only can it save you a lot of money, um, uh, save you a lot of time, uh, but also a lot of money on cloud because on cloud, you are paying for each minute of each virtual machine that you're using. And so if you can avoid having to redo a whole bunch of jobs um, for, for a large pipeline, that can make a huge difference in your, in your ability to get the work done, uh, recover from failures um, without it becoming very expensive. Uh, voilà. Okay, so let's talk about the Cromwell backends. Um, Cromwell was uh, originally designed uh, for portability across many different platforms. The idea was that you would want to have one engine that you can use on any platform. Um, that way, you don't have to <laughs> you, you don't have to start porting workflows into different languages if you're using something that's not support that doesn't support the particular backends that you want. Um, in practice, uh, there are a number of uh, local and uh, cluster schedulers that are supported, uh, that are available, I should say. They're available. Most have been contributed by various groups in the community. Um, they're not actively maintained by the Cromwell team uh, itself. Uh, but they do take uh, pull requests if um, groups want to submit updates or, or extensions to um, the existing backends. Uh, there are also some cloud backends uh, that are available, and those are the ones we are much more focused on uh, within the Broad um, because that's what we use for our own production needs. Uh, so the Google Cloud uh, backend is the one that we have been uh, using from the start. Um, Originally, it was called the Pipelines API, and then it became the uh, Life Sciences API. And I've heard that now they're coming out with kind of the next generation, which is called uh, just Batch, I believe, Batch API. Um, and so that is the component that's operated by Google Cloud that um, performs, that, that that's Cromwell talks to, um, and that actually orchestrates uh, retrieving virtual machines and doing all the install and everything that needs to happen to do the work on Google Cloud. Uh, there's something equivalent, I believe, on AWS uh, that uses AWS Batch. Um, uh, and for that, if you're interested in running Cromwell on AWS, I would contact the team that makes the genomic CLI over there uh, because they are actively developing those capabilities. Um, we do not use AWS ourselves, and so uh, our ability to help you with that is a little more limited. Um, I also want to mention the GA4GHTS or TES uh, backend. Uh, if you're not familiar, uh, GA4GH stands for the uh, Global Alliance for Genomics and Health. Um, it's a uh, it's an important, not very well known. Uh, not that well known in the uh, scientific community, uh, but very well known in the more infrastructure development community. Um, I would say, I hope I can say it like that. Uh, that is developing standards for um, uh, topics around genomics. So that includes uh, infrastructure standards, software standards, but also policy standards for how to share genomic data in a responsible, secure, and ethical way, um, as well as how to orchestrate uh, services and tools that run genomics um, uh, efficiently. And so the task execution service, not to get to the point, of GA4GH is something that is very important and increasingly being used um, to uh, manage Cromwell uh, execution, not just Cromwell, but a number of other tools also starting to adopt uh, TESS, the task execution schema, um, to be able to uh, provide compatibility with different kinds of infrastructure. Um, moving on, because I realize that I'm talking a lot and time is uh, fleeting. This takes us to Cromwell services on the cloud. I'm going to... Uh, mention specifically some services that are available and accessible to all. Um, one is called Terra. Um, 
and that's a platform that we co-develop with Microsoft and Verily. Um, and then there's Microsoft, the Cromwell on Azure, which right now is um, developed by a team at Microsoft. And that is actually going to get tied together because we have been working, uh, Terra right now runs on Google, um, but we have been working with Microsoft to extend um, uh, ability to uh, work on Azure as well. Um, and so these are convergent paths. So let me tell you a little bit more about Terra. Um, it's, uh, as I mentioned, it's a platform that we co-developed with Microsoft and Verily. And it's a platform that's intended to help biomedical researchers to access data, run analysis tools, um, and collaborate and also share data um, in a very hopefully user-friendly way. The goal is really to put at uh, the, the disposal of a wide range of people, the kind of power, uh, powerful tools, access to data, et cetera, um, that, that we enjoy. And um, this is something that's part of some large collaborations. Um, I would love to tell you more at another time. I'm going to focus specifically on the workflow capabilities um, because Terra has a managed Cromwell service that under the hood um, manages a, a actually multiple Cromwell servers. There's multiple instances of Cromwell running within Terra. And there's uh, a fairly sophisticated system that allows us to take in a large number of uh, WIDL uh, workflow submissions, balance the loads uh, so, to, so that everybody can always access it. You don't have to wait for a long time in a queue and things like that. And you can run your workflows um, at very large scale on Google Cloud. And it's designed with graphical interfaces that make it easier for people without a strong programming fam familiarity or strong familiarity with the command line to actually be able to run these complex workflows um, at any scale uh, without, um, without having to go through uh, command line tools. Uh, and you can find there, there's some really neat tutorials on the Terra website, so I won't go into detail, but the, the idea is really to make it, uh, make it less of a hassle to do this kind of work at uh, pretty much any scale. Now, I have a few examples of uh, studies that use this um, for their own work and have, have uh, produced pretty extraordinary results. I'm not going to have time to explain all of them, but I will upload um, my slides with some links and I encourage you to check them out because they, they can give you a concrete sense. Uh, all of these, um, so there's the, the Telomere to Telomere Variant Calling Project, um, which uh, did some really interesting large scale work. Uh, there's a cancer proteogenomics project called Panoply um, that is doing really cool things in terms of making like, flagship proteogenomics workflows available to their community uh, through Terra. And uh, there's also a really neat example from uh, epidemiology of uh, teams that are collaborating together uh, through Terra um, as part of uh, the uh, COVID surveillance and uh, response work. Um, and so all of these uh, have used Terra very effectively. Um, all of them have written blogs about their experience and you can find the links here. Um, and again, I'll, I'll upload that after the presentation um, if you want to check it out and see how, if that would help you uh, gauge um, whether this would be relevant to your own research and your own work. So I want to leave you with the message that Whittle is increasingly used, uh, Whittle and Cromwell are increasingly used by some very large projects. Um, there are many resources, many places to find existing workflows, uh, as well as resources for developing your own workflows. And so I encourage you to, to check those out. If you're looking to do certain types of analyses, chances are that workflows already exist, that you don't have to reinvent everything from scratch. And either some of them you might be able to use out of the box, some of them you might have to do some um, work to adapt them to your specific uh, use case. But there's really a great opportunity to uh, save yourself a lot of time and effort by starting from something that exists. 
Uh, one really good place to look for those is DocStore. Uh, DocStore.org uh, is a place where um, organizations are increasingly depositing their Widdle workflows. There's also Widdle's uh, <laughs> workflows in uh, CWL, uh, NextFlow, and I believe Galaxy now is supported. Um, so there's a lot there uh, that you can find. And very conveniently, uh, DocStore offers the possibility if you find a workflow that you like, you can open it up and launch it in Terra or other platforms um, that are made available, uh, that are connected uh, through the system. So I leave you with this final uh, short list of uh, resources that uh, you, you might find interesting to learn more. Uh, the open Whittle repositories on GitHub certainly are a great place to go, um, as well as the Cromwell Read the Docs uh, documentation. Uh, TerraBio has some Whittle resources and, and generally speaking has some really great um, tutorials for learning to run workflows um, at scale. Uh, and then finally, a quick shameless plug for a book I co-authored with um, my good friend, Brian O'Connor, uh, that was published by O'Reilly in 2020, uh, 2020 um, which is about genomics in the cloud and kind of charts a path from the basics of genomics, like what's basic genomics, what's GATK, how do you use it for various use cases, kind of going through the science of that um, and then working through, well, uh, actually composing and using pipelines, uh, using Whittle, uh, running them on Cromwell locally and then on the cloud, and then finally uh, using Terra to integrate that with large-scale data resources that are made available there. Um, that is it. Thank you so much for your attention. I would love to answer questions if you have any. Um, fire away. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you very much. For the great presentation, lots of details. Thank you. Um, I believe I I will check the chat right now if you have any questions, but I'll give some time for people to to write it down. Uh, meanwhile, um, I have one one question. Um, as I mentioned, we we also use uh, uh, WDL here, mm -hmm. and our cloud cloud infrastructure is. is um, is the, the AWS, we use AWS, AWS batch. Uh, so, I mean, we, we use WDL and, and for, for most of the work, it, it really gets the work done. It's really good. It's easy to, to use and easy to code. But um, also when we are trying to make more more complex pipelines, we've got to take a, if we take a closer look, sometimes we miss some, some, some built-in functions or, or other common or uh, language uh, users that it would make it use easier to, to code. And uh, I'd like to know your your opinion about uh, when when we compare uh, WDL with the other language that you also mentioned, like Nextflow or SnakeMake. Uh, how do you see WDL compared with this this other workflow languages and uh, if you see that in the community, the, the developers are how how they are working on in the near future to make more WDL improvements and language improvements. Thanks. That's a great question. Um, so there's there's kind of three parts. Um, I will say I will try to be brief. Uh, one part is from um, just to get it out of the way from the Terra perspective, we're in interested in adding support for more languages um, because honestly, it's it's impossible to make everybody happy with a, with a single language. Um, people's needs and preferences are, are too varied. Uh, so from that uh, point of view, we are we have plans to add support for um, other languages and you can check out the Terra blog. We, we blogged about that fairly recently. Um, the um, other side, more from the from the Whittle perspective, um, from being a en Whittle enthusiast myself, um, I mean, it is my job to talk about it, but I also, I find it as a former practicing biologist uh, coming from the wet lab who didn't have a lot of programming experience, um, I find it's very uh, more easy to use than some other languages. Um, 
I think one of the things that frustrates people sometimes, especially coming from uh, probably Nextflow, especially SnakeMake, um, is that you have less, uh, you can't resort to, to as big of a software library. Like Whittle, um, and in many ways, CWL is very similar, I think. Um, it's a language that's intentionally very small and limited in terms of the number of things that you can do with it, um, because it aims to, <laughs> to, to do a subset of things really well and explicitly disallow um, other things. And, and I talked a little bit about the separation. Uh, I think of it as separation of church and state, uh, separation of the science that you want to do and separation of how it should get done. Um, because something like SnakeMake, because it's based in Python, gives you a lot more flexibility to do all sorts of things as part of your workflow script that kind of, it makes it easy to do things in a way, but it also allows you to muddle the line between like what is the analysis job versus how is it implemented in practice. Um, which once you get into that, uh, that's one of the things that can limit portability and make it harder, uh, harder to take your script and, and run it on a very different infrastructure, um, because you have more things to account for. So it's, it's, it's hard, I think for, for prototyping, uh, it is very tempting to use something more like snake make. And it makes a lot of sense, um, especially if you're super familiar with Python already. If you want to do something that's like production scale, that's going to be run on 10,000 uh, workflows at a pop, um, and that's going to be used uh, in a way that requires more scalability and more portability, I would tend to prefer something like Whittle or CWL because they're really designed for that. Um, and they they don't let you do as much, but it's intentional. That being said, there is we do recognize that sometimes there are things that would be useful to do that are worth the extra complexity. Um, and for that, join openwhittle.org. Um, there's we're actually working on the next version of the specification, kind of next evolution. And there are some features that, that have been proposed um, that are very popular. So the, the language itself will continue to evolve to serve the needs of the people who use it. But it is true that it is intentionally and it will continue to be intentionally limited um, because of its design philosophy, if that makes sense. Yes, okay. Makes sense. It's a trade off, right? So. It, it is a trade off, yeah. yeah. Okay, let me see if we have more questions here. Yeah, there are questions in the chat. I don't know if you said how Jeannie can yeah. read you from there. I think that from, uh, from Pedro, from Oliveira, from Taniguchi, from Aira, from Lucio, Joseph. Uh Okay. Let me let me uh, right away uh, address because I almost included it in the in the presentation and it didn't. The question about using Whittle tasks that are already made directly in your workflows. Um, yes, uh, so that's that's one of the things that was added over the past couple of years. I want to say is the ability to import um, a library of tasks. So the examples that I showed kind of assume for simplicity that you have your workflow and the task definitions in the same file. But actually you can absolutely have your tasks in a separate file. And you can even, you can even import, um, you can import a file, like a library of Whittle tasks from GitHub. Um, and so that way, if you want, like, so there's a reference to the warp repository. Warp repository is a, a repo that's maintained uh, by the Broad Institute that has all of our production pipelines plus others from large collaborations. Um, increasingly, the 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 team that met, that maintains develops and maintains those workflows actually does it in a very modular way. So there's like they make libraries of tasks. You can absolutely. Um, 
import that directly into your workflows so you don't have to duplicate any code. Um, and we have an effort on the GHK team side, there's an effort to automatically generate Whittle wrappers for all GHK tools because there's like 200 tools in that toolkit at this point. Um, and there's no reason for everybody to have to write their own task definition for each tool. Um, and so there's an effort, uh, the, the first step is in place. There's some additional work that needs to be done to really make it useful, but um, you'll be able to just import the GTK task library, for example, um, and use that out of the box. And, and we would like to encourage everybody to use that kind of approach because it really um, helps cut down on code duplication. Uh, it helps for version control. It helps for a lot of things. And I will also say you can even import another workflow into your workflow. So you can modularize your workflows, have workflows of nested workflows. I believe there's no technical limit to the number of workflows you can nest like Russian dolls. There's probably a point where you should stop. <laughs> just for uh, manageability, but um, that is also something you can do to avoid having, and I, I, I will make one more little sidebar and then I'll take the next question, but it's possible uh, to use conditional statements to change the flow of logic depending on some, you can have a Boolean and say, do, do I want to do this, this step or that step? Uh, in my workflow and you want to be able to just parameterize that in an easy way. Um, sometimes people go a little nuts with that, with, with having a lot of conditionals, it complicates the workflows. Sometimes it's actually easier to modularize your workflows, have a few different workflows, and then you write a master workflow that just ties them together. Um, so there's, there's a lot of strategies for how to write your workflows in a way that's sustainable, um, that live in mostly in the heads of a small number of people in the world who have done a lot of Whittle work. Uh, one of the things we'd like to do in the coming year is get that information out of their heads and on, on paper or in GitHub as it were. Um, and we're going to um, be driving an effort to collect best practices and kind of Whittle design recommendations um, to, to share that more widely, uh, both from people on our own data engineering team, but also in, in other institutions that have been using um, Whittle for a while. And Raphael, if, if your team has recommendations and things like that, we'd love to get contributions as well. Okay. Uh... So I, I read another question here from uh, Oliveira, which is also a curiosity of mine. Um, can you successfully successfully run workflows in AWS with call caching, uh, with images within the AWS ECR, which is it's, uh, where we, we keep our Docker containers, the, the container registry? Uh, for some reason, we, we can't do it, uh, this, this integration with, um, Chrome and AWS bed for a call question. That's a good question that I can't answer because I'm not familiar enough with the AWS backend. Uh, but I would really recommend um, contacting um, the Genomic CLI team because they've had a lot of experience using um, Cromwell on AWS. Um, and I mean, batches is, is kind of their thing. So yeah. uh, I, would, I would definitely recommend contacting them. Um, Lee Peng at AWS is a great um, developer advocate and resource. Um, he, he, he has written some of the AWS blogs so you can find him or uh, get in touch with me and I can introduce you to him. Uh, Lee Peng, okay. Um, you like to have this contact. Okay, this question, Miguel, or you are just, okay. Uh, Mayra Rodriguez, uh, Georgina, I'm a big fan. Thank you for the excellent presentation. Uh, which would you say is the most expensive workflow to run on the cloud? And if you have uh, a figure or an estimative for, for a number of samples. Uh, the so most expensive. Um, uh, I mean, that's, the that's most expensive is, is the, the, genomic, the genome workflow from five years ago, which the, our, our very first, I mean, it's, it's not the most ever, but um, 
it's it's one thing that has stuck in my mind that when we originally moved to the cloud and did our very first implementation of the Broad's whole genome large scale production uh, pipeline for for analyzing whole genome sequencing data, um, the very first one I think was about eighty five dollars per sample. Um, that got quickly cut down to forty five. That was plateaued for a while. And then through some additional optimizations, that got brought down to $5 per sample. And, and a few years ago, we had this blog post about the $5 genome. Um, it actually went up by a couple of dollars for reasons that were out of our control. I think uh, some were security related, some, some were infrastructure changes. But basically, um, short <laughs> answer is, there are certain optimizations that can pay off in a really big way in terms of optimizing for cost. Um, the uh, Human Cell Atlas project folks recently did a bunch of optimizations on how they use the HCA workflows. Um, and they were able to dramatically bring down, there's, there's a blog post that's going to be written on that hopefully in a few weeks. Uh, I can't commit to timeline, but um, they massively brought down the cost of uh, some of the their single cell analysis pipelines. Um, and that's that's kind of part of what I was leading to with the the optimizations and the recommendations that we'd like to get out of people's heads and and share more um, more widely because there it can make a big difference. So sometimes, when you migrate to the cloud first, or when you're trying it out, and you have you write a first version of your pipeline, uh, some folks get costs per sample or per unit of data that can be a little scary. Um, and but that's usually because they're quote unquote naive implementation that don't take advantage of certain features. Um, those features are not well known enough, and that's something that I think uh, we need to do more outreach about to just help people um, because it doesn't have to be super expensive. Um, there's some really, really big uh, um, savings that you can get. Geraldini, in my yeah. old calculations, uh, however, if you use your analysis, if you run your pipelines 24 hours per seven days, the amount of money that you you expend the rent in the cloud uh, is five times the price of buying the machine. So maybe if we, some people are specialized on some analysis and and run twenty four per seven, then it's uh, it's okay to buy the the system. Yeah, I mean, I I would definitely not say that cloud is necessarily for for everybody, I think it depends on the analysis. It depends on how off, how heavily you're able to optimize on one system versus the other. Um, it also depends if you're counting the salaries of the people who are maintaining the machines, um, because and 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 the electricity that it costs to run it. And so so there's a number of um, there's a number of factors that come into play for sure. And and I think it's the answer is often not widely applicable. It's not one size fits all. And and definitely we see people who are, are better off uh, for some use cases um, on one or the other. Um, I think it's just difficult. It's difficult to get a straight answer on this sort of thing. And it takes yeah. a lot of um, evaluation to, to get an accurate answer of how it works out for you. But, I would say, like, sorry, sorry. Even in an institution like Broad Institute, uh, you you think that running 24 per seven, it's worth a range in the cloud instead of uh, setting up a big cluster there? Yeah, so one of the things, um, that's actually something I didn't, talk about, uh, I, I mentioned in the beginning, I, I wasn't going to justify really why you should go to the cloud. I'm just gonna assume you're going at some point. Um, oh yeah, some some of us need to go because yeah, yeah. they do not have the cluster. <laughs> so actually it's, it's about the data. Um, a big part of the reason why uh, it makes sense to the, go to the cloud is if you want to take advantage of these massive data sets that are, getting um, generated now, there's 
petabytes of data and not everybody has the storage capacity to have just the the entire thing copied on their local infrastructure. And so we actually see that the cost of compute is what often gets a lot of play in terms of does it make sense or not, but access to the data is really a major factor. Um, mm -hmm. For us, it's being able to share data um, and, and develop these large collaborations. Um, one of the things we are involved in is the All of Us research program in the US, which aims to gather medical records and genome sequencing and a lot of other um, omics data types for up to a million citizens. Um, and there, nobody has the space to put all the information in one place, right? Um, and to be able to make it available to everybody, we have to use cloud. And there's a number of um, projects like that, like UK Biobank really benefits from um, using cloud. I mean, they're, they're not all the way there, but... Um, and so access to interesting data, especially for people who may not have the ability to generate their own data at the scale that they, they would mm -hmm. like, um, it makes it possible for a lot more people with great ideas to be able to interrogate sufficiently large data sets to, mm -hmm. to get meaningful answers without, in many cases, without having to generate a lick of data themselves. That makes a lot of sense, yes. Yeah. So. so, so just to, to remember, you mentioned that you were able to go down uh, to five five dollars uh, at, at WGS sample. I mean, uh, yes, that is per sample for the going from unmapped reads uh, all the way to a GVCF with and FPGA. Then, yeah. uh, no, just regular CPU. Regular right. CPU. Um, and that's a combination of uh, using preemptibles. So on Google Cloud specifically, using a preemptible machines, um, which is the equivalent of the AWS spot machines. Spot uh, instances. Yeah, okay. uh -huh. um, there's, there's some challenges around using those because you can get kicked off of the machine halfway through and then you have to redo it. Uh, yeah, but basically- Within two or three hours. Yeah, so if if cost is more important to you than than turnover time, um, you can take the risk because the the instances cost about I think it's twenty percent of the normal cost, and so as long as you don't get preempted more than three times, it's still cost effective, um, and you save a lot of money. So that's that's one of the big ways we save money on the production pipeline. Um, it does mean that. Um, you won't get those, if you get preempted even just a few times, um, you won't have the shortest possible runtime for your workflow. But for us in terms of production, uh, we don't need it to be done in, in half an hour. There are specialized hardware solutions that can do that, but we're fine with having a 24 hour turnover for the analysis because it's not immobilizing any of our machines. They're just VMs in the cloud. So as long as there are more VMs available, we don't need, it's, it's not a problem um, if it runs a little longer. And the, the bulk of the time for, for a sequencing project, the bulk of the time is spent in the wet lab anyway. Um, actually prepping the samples and sequencing them takes more time. And so having a 24 hour whole genome analysis pipeline is not a problem. Um, it is a problem for people with on-prem clusters because during that time, your cluster is immobilized and you can't run anything else. But for us, it's not, we just, we just get more VMs if we need them. Um, so that's, that's a, where the trade-off is just very different. Um, but if, if you do care very much about having the fastest possible um, access to your answer, like if your developers cost more per minute <laughs> than, than the virtual machines, then, uh, then it is better to not use preemptibles and consider, yeah, more specialized hardware. Um, and there's some there's some exciting developments on that front uh, that that are in the works. Um, Great. Did we uh, answer Rodrigo, Tanya? If people want to open the camera and ask the question here, you are welcome. All right. 
So I'll, I'll go to the next one that I can see here. It's from Joyce Javier. Um, thanks, Eugene, for the great presentation. Already using Terra, sharing data in notebooks, but is still struggling to get started with the workflows. Do you have any suggestion for hands-on training for beginners in the dev development Docker? Uh, yeah, that's that's easy. Your own book, right? Oh well, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, chapter eight is hopefully helpful. Chapter seven and eight, um, but I would say uh, actually eight and nine. Um, I would say that there's there's kind of a gap right now in the resources that we have um, between like there's a lot of resources for writing a hello world or, or like a, a super basic workflow like what I showed today. Um, that's pretty easy. Um, but then there's a, a, a lack of resources for taking the next step of, of writing something big or something real. Um, we have a team that has, so a, a subset of our uh, user education team has been uh, taking an interest in that problem recently, um, partly because the our, the Terra Whittle uh, materials were were a bit out of date, severely out of date, I can say, I think. Um, and they, they're in the process of updating that. And while they're updating them, they're going to put that in the Open Whittle, um, in a new repository in the Open Whittle uh, GitHub organization. Um, and the goal is to do first a first pass of improvement of updating the materials, filling in the gaps, the, the immediate gaps, um, but also uh, hopefully um, spurring some contributions from the community because it, it, it's it's delicate. It's like we the Terra team does not have enough resources to go out and write very elaborate uh, Whittle um, education resources, uh, just like we don't write tutorials about Python or about other things that we support in the platform. Um, but we recognize that there is a, a real need in the community. So we're hoping that by by investing with some effort in, in the next few months, um, generating some new resources and hopefully getting some collaborators. We have a few interested collaborators who are going to contribute to that. And we'd love to get contributions from the wider community. Um, hopefully we can all pull together and kind of fill in those gaps because it is it is a thing um, that that gap between the, the beginner and expert level is, is kind of a, a problem. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Gerardini, can you uh, get some postdocs there to work? Because uh, some Brazilians here are finishing PhD and maybe they could be interested in working abroad. Um, so the challenge there is that uh, we don't, the, the data sciences platform, our part of the organization is not an academic uh, body. So we are, we're, we're, we function more like a software development company. Um, we don't have postdocs. We have collaborations with labs who employ postdocs, but we don't, mm -hmm. we're not able to uh, directly. So um, the connection would be MIT or Harvard, right? Forget yeah, I, I would say, yeah, I would say uh, find if, if some postdocs are interested in, in coming over here, um, it's or, or people who want to do a postdoc at the Broad, uh, you would want to find one of the academic labs that has, and, and those basically the PIs have joint appointments with the Broad and with like their home, home institution, academic mm -hmm. institution, like Harvard, uh, MIT, there's- UMass, UMass. My ex student yes. uh, is from UMass. Uh -huh. yeah, there you go. Yeah, and so so they have joint appointments. They have space at the borough, but they also have um, mm -hmm. their home institution, and they can they can take on uh, postdocs. And so if you find people you 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 would like to work with, okay, uh, okay. that is that is a way in. Geraldini, I met uh, Jorge this morning from UK. He's from South Africa, right? Introduce yourself, Jorge. Hi, Geraldine. Thank you, Miguel. Uh, so I'm working with Welcome Connecting Science, and we may have a use case um, because we have a lot of intermediate bioinformaticians who are trying to take the next step, in, especially with SARS-CoV-2 analysis, to taking it to scale. So uh, my question would be, have you seen uh, Woodall, Cromwell, and Cloud used for large-scale education? Um, what do you mean by large-scale education? So like more than 200 users on a course. Ah, 
Um, we have not done it. We have not done it. I, I'm not aware of anybody who has done it at that scale. Um, yeah, most of the efforts I'm aware of are more modest in size. Mm -hmm. um, but we'd be interested in supporting that if 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 that's something. What that's... about a workshop, Geraldine? Because you you saw you, 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 we saw some examples uh, of G, GTK, etc. So do you think it, it should be possible to set up a workshop hands-on using Chrome? Yeah, I, I, that's that's an interesting question. I would say, um, and we have done workshops in the past, we, including Whittle and Cromwell workshops as part of the GHK workshops. Um, we we did a lot of workshops uh, a number of years ago. Um, I, I'm no longer running that part. I used to run the team that, that does that. I no longer am. Um, I would say the COVID pandemic actually kind of made us reevaluate priorities and we stopped doing, for the most part, we stopped doing um, in-person workshops uh, and we put a lot more effort into uh, virtual workshops. Uh, at a human level, I much prefer in-person. Um, in practice, we can reach and, and help a lot more people uh, virtually, but it, it's not the same thing, right? Um, we, we still uh, can consider uh, in-person workshops. And actually, I think we have a, a team that's going soon to Brazil to do a workshop. Um, yes, yeah, we have we have a. Uh, it, it was postponed. Francisco Lobo, I think, is hosting uh, a workshop here. At the Belo Horizonte, is my is here. Or or Which... Salvador, maybe. Which one are you referring to, São Paulo? I think it's Sao Paulo, yeah. Yeah, it, it was at postponed. Einstein. It will be, yeah. It it will be in the uh, the end of October, but it, yes. it was postponed for for next year. Oh, mm -hmm. I am out of date. I didn't know that. It's it, it's it's been just a few days that that we, it it happened, so we are not that outdated. Okay, I I was on vacation until last week, so um, I guess I need to go talk to my colleagues. Um, <laughs> that's unfortunate, but I'm sure we'll make it happen eventually. So yeah. we are we're still doing a, a small number, much smaller number of workshops. Um, the challenge there, I think, is. And we have run into that doing uh, code-related workshops it has historically been harder than our science-focused workshops because our, our GTK workshops we, we accumulated a lot of experience there and and it's more about teaching the logic of the processing what you need to do to the data how you identify variants how you 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 deal with artifacts and things like that. Um, it's not really about the code and it's not really about running the commands, even though we do some of that. I think hands-on programming workshops is something we have less experience in. Um, honestly, I think we would love to support somebody who has more experience in that area um, and support them in developing and, and delivering that kind of workshop. I think that Georgie wants to set up a workshop and is planning to do it with Chrome, right, George? Uh, we are exploring all sorts of options because we're trying to meet the needs of people who don't have access to computational clusters mm -hmm. that's whatsoever. So uh, mainly developing countries where they have a lot of need for bioinformatics expertise uh, and scaling, but the infrastructure isn't there. Have you have you talked at all to the people at Theogen, Theogen Genomics? Mm -mm. It's a, it's a fairly small uh, company that's uh, located in the Southwest US and they've been doing a ton of work. Um, uh, they started out um, helping the public health labs in the US uh, get coordinated uh, for SARS-CoV and they did a lot of development of Whittle workflows for um, viral genomics analysis. Wow. Um, they are right now uh, doing an effort on monkeypox. Uh, that's going to uh, be talked about soon, I think. And they they have done a lot of work um, worldwide in African countries, South Asia. Uh, they've ran workshops. Um, they use they use Terra uh, for a lot of it, uh -huh. not all of it. Um, but they have been developing. Uh, both materials for uh, learning Whittle um, uh, and also recommendation and guidance 
for collaborative improvement of WIDL workflow by collaborating teams like public health labs, where there's there's a need for greater coordination. They're they're fantastic, and I'd love to introduce you if if it makes sense. I would I would love to meet them. Thank you, General Dean. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. We've we had, we had uh, 90 people uh, adding people from uh, YouTube and Rafael, I, I copied some uh, questions from YouTube and, uh, and posted here. I, I was I asked about, uh, about the time. Uh, uh, is it okay to make a few more questions, Roger? Uh, I have time. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Okay, so one more here from Rodrigo Guarishi. Uh, data processing of that just data is a big issue, but storage costs may be even more painful. Uh, any plans to improve support on data archiving on Terra? Yes, um, there is actually, so currently the, um, the most immediate way that you store data on Terra is you, you create a workspace that comes with a storage bucket and then you can put whatever you want in that storage bucket. Um, and then you, you combine that with a system of data tables, which is like data manifests that you can use to be able to launch workflows on the data in, in um, through the interfaces that I showed screenshots of. Um, that's the basic approach. Um, that works fine for small data sets uh, but it, there's data management challenges around that. And one of the things that we developed for large projects but are now technically available to anyone is uh, what we call the, um, the data repo, uh, the Terra data repo, TDR. Uh, we haven't talked about it much yet. We have some plans to, to, to start pointing people to it just because it's been on under additional improvements. Um, and we, we wouldn't want people to um, encounter difficulties with something that's not quite ready for prime time, but I think we're getting close. Um, and that is a data management system that uses the, the Terra infrastructure, but adds um, additional layers and functionality that is more appropriate for if you want to manage data um, in a sustainable way including share it. There's some tie-ins with, um, uh, there's a system that was also developed at the Broad um, to manage access to data sets based on data use. Um, so to, to be able to manage, um, you know, if you have data that comes with a specific consents, uh, there's a system that manages that. All that is, is part of the ecosystem that we're um, developing. Um, so, sorry, <laughs> long story short, I, I would say my answer is the Terra data repo is, I think, going to help a lot with that question. Um, stay tuned. I hope to be able to, to um, have something on the Terra blog about that within a, a couple of months at most. Um, but it, it is something that's already available if you, if you search or data repo in the Terra knowledge base. There's documentation on how to use it and so on. Uh, we just haven't done a lot of outreach effort about it yet. So feel free to, to go be a, an early adopter and, and poke at it as much as you like. Uh, Great. So here. You know that we have to ask about the pig and we have to ask about Terra because Terra is the the way of writing earth in Portuguese. Oh, yes, indeed. <laughs> um, yeah, the, the, uh, I, I'm, my native language is French and it's la terre. So, la terre. Yeah, well, um, the- Exactly like in Portuguese, G-E-R-R-A? Uh, no, it ends with an E instead, but otherwise- e, yeah, terra is Portuguese. It's also Latin, yeah. <laughs> it's also Latin, of course. Yeah, I think we have the, that common root. Uh -huh. um, so it's, uh, the, the name was chosen uh, in part because we wanted to uh, evoke that idea of uh, ecosystems um, and yeah, openness yes. and the fact that it's, it's for everyone. Um, it, it really is intended to be open to the global research community. Um, mm -hmm. Right now, there are still some outstanding questions around data uh, residency. Uh, by default, everything lives in 
servers in the US. Um, as of a few months ago, it's possible to choose uh, a couple of places in Canada um, to store your data and do compute. Uh, and there are plans to expand that to other, uh, to more international um, uh, set of locations. The, the idea is that will be expanded gradually so that if you have certain constraints um, around like the data needs to live within uh, the boundaries of your own country, um, that will ultimately be possible. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah. Captain, Captain Kirk from Enterprise, because that pig looks like the Enterprise. Air yes. Prime. Yes. Uh, so actually, it's it's more a Picard reference. Um, I mean, you might be familiar with with well, I'm sure you're familiar with the Picard software. Picard Toolkit was also uh, originally created in part at the Broad. Um, there's a history of Star Trek related names in our work. Uh, GHK mm -hmm. had it, there was um, a module that was called Tribble. Uh, the Cromwell uh, mascot was actually the product of a late night conversation uh, between um, the Cromwell developers and I. Uh, it was a Thursday evening after our uh, Thursday social hour, which mm -hmm. always had a nice selection of beer. We all went home and then uh, we met back up on Slack again. And we talked about how we needed a logo or a mascot of some sort. Okay. And so it's an homage to James Cromwell, the American actor who was um, the farmer in the, the movie Babe about the little pig who wants to be a shepherd dog. Okay. And, and on the other side, uh, he played Zephram Cochran, who is the inventor of warp drive in Star Trek. Uh, in Star Trek VIII's first contact. And so the pig marries the, oops, uh, sorry about that. <laughs> the the Cromwell logo marries the pig from Babe and the uh, warp nacelles from the Enterprise. Um, it is technically the Kirk era Enterprise uh, nacelles because they're easier to draw. Um, in and this probably this audience is the only one that knows the full history of Cromwell. <laughs> Um, possibly. I mean, I, I do, possibly. I think we talk about it in the book, um, mm -hmm. uh, genomics in the cloud book, but there you go. That, that is the, uh, the official story for the Just genesis see. of the Cromwell pig. Did you guys felt important now? See? Hmm? Uh, the audience felt, feels important because they know the, <laughs> the, the history. You're a small, part of a small club. <laughs> yeah, see? Yeah. Um, Rafael, did we read all the questions there from the, there were 90 people in the audience because many people were in YouTube, they are already there. <laughs> there is one more that you copy here from Lucas Taniguchi. Um, thank you for your answer. Um, do you know about the best ways to do the pumping automatic tests or any material to, to point the way? Uh, automatic tests on Whittle? Or on Cromwell? Sorry, I didn't... it's not specified here. The if Lucas is still, oh, yeah. is still there. Uh, best way: plumbing automatic tests. If you're still on Lucas, can you can you clarify what you? Yeah, Lucas, if you'd like to open your microphone. There is another question from Pedro, right? Because otherwise, oh, oh yeah. I, I was going to say um, the the basic way of testing the the Whittle syntax. There's a utility that allows you to do that, um, but that's just the syntax. If you want to test with, um, yes, sorry, I, I have a brain cell that just woke up. Um, there's a Whittle testing framework that was. There's two actually. One was written. I believe by the BioWiddle project people who are in uh, the Netherlands. Um, if you look up BioWiddle, I'm pretty sure they're the ones who had that one of the testing frameworks. And there's another one that I'm currently blanking on. But if you ask in the OpenWiddle um, community, I think that's the best place to, to, to ask about that. And there is, there is actually a, a small corpus of automated tests that has been, that was written as part of a test hackathon that we did in early 2020, just before the lockdown started. 
Um, and that is in, uh, I think, a repo called Testathon in the OpenWiddle org um, in GitHub. That I, I think that's that's the right place to look for um, testing related uh, resources. Sorry. Great. I have one last question here. I'm not quite sure if I understood it. It's from Pedro Rezende. Uh, is it possible to apply the task resource management into cluster different queues? Uh, task resource oh. management to cluster different queues? Oh, uh, so basically to configure Cromwell to send jobs to different cluster queues? Mm. Um, I don't know. I, I, I would assume that it depends. Yeah, on like to work as a grid. Yeah. Um, I don't know off the top of my head, but I would think that would be a backend configuration thing where you, you mm -hmm. should be able to send. You know what? Uh, we have a system here that developed by a colleague of Rafael in the lab. Actually, the backend cluster looks to the central one to mm -hmm. see the queues. So you might have some 5, 10, 12 uh, backend clusters looking at the crown. Uh, yes, it, it's, it's possible to have several queues. Uh, I'm not sure if that's the, the question or if he meant something else. I guess maybe the question is how you would control that on a whittle by whittle basis, like if you yeah, could maybe you pass that in as well. The, the charge. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if that's something that can be put like in the. In you the have to handle something in the back end mm -hmm. execution machine that will count how many cores uh, free they have idle. And then we we'll, we we'll ask for for running in a central uh, queue. I mean, there there is a specific uh, uh, label or specific parameter for for the queue. I'm I, I'm I'm oh, yeah. saying about uh, uh, AWS Batch. I don't know how it works on, on Google Cloud, but there is a specific mm -hmm. parameter that you insert at the runtime block within your task where you say the AWS queue specifically. Oh. So, and other other parameters about memory, CPU usage, and everything else, it's, it's all the same, but you have a specific one for the queue. Oh, I did not know that. There yeah. you go. Mm. Okay. Okay. So. Time to go. Let's thank you, Georgine, for your great yeah, presentation, so for your time, for all the answers, for all the additional history about the pig. <laughs> And everything else. Well, thank you so much for all the great questions. Um, it was it was really a pleasure. And if anybody has follow up, follow up questions, feel free to to um, uh, reach out on uh, by email Geraldine at broadinstitute.org uh, or on Twitter. I'm always happy to respond to questions there, um, and and on the Open Middle Slack as well. Thanks a lot, Geraldine. We expected that uh, it will be inspiring to our community and that many people will start using. I hope so too. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you, everyone. So, see you guys. Bye bye. Ciao. Ciao, Miguel. Bye.